Hello everyone, welcome to English Champion. On this episode, we are diving into uh, an article that appeared in The New Yorker about two weeks ago. And uh, it's about the decline of the English major at uh, American universities. And uh, there's a lot of interesting things to discuss here. Um, a lot that these scholars, uh, these people in academia get wrong. And I'm going to clarify a lot of it for you. Um, it's a very long article. Uh, it's about a 10,000 word essay uh, by Nathan Heller. And it covers a lot of uh, aspects of university life. And uh, I'm going to clarify it for you and uh, try to help you understand what's really going on in the field of English and the humanities in general, because uh, what many people think just isn't so. So let's dive in. The author of the article spends a lot of time at two prominent universities, one in the Ivy League, one a, a major state university, uh, and talks to students and faculty from a variety of other schools as well. But um, predominantly, the, the author... Um, really explores these two universities that are quite well known for their English programs. Um, and at most places around the country, there are a few exceptions, the, the number of English majors has declined quite rapidly, especially in the last 10 years, um, but it had begun slightly before that. Um, at this one university, they uh, have dropped in the number of English majors um, by nearly half. Um, they fell from over 950 to 570. Um, what's so interesting about that is the reasons why people offer for the decline. And there are there are several. I'm not saying it's just one thing, but uh, many of the reasons given here just don't quite add up. One reason that is talked a lot about uh, in the article is funding, state funding or, or government funding of universities. Some claim basically that um, you know, uh, public funding for universities has declined. Therefore, the number of people who are interested in the humanities has declined. Those two things do not go together. Um, that, that might be true, but they're more correlative than causative for sure. Um, just because funding has gone down doesn't mean suddenly, magically, people don't want to study Shakespeare anymore. Um, there are other reasons that I will get into. Um, one of those is that there are just way more majors than there used to be. I was just looking up, I was trying to find a, you know, a list of majors that are quite new that didn't exist a long time ago and it took me about five seconds to find a website that had compiled them. But it's everything from uh, nutrition science to robotics to um, things having to do, of course, with all the gender and sexuality studies, um, video game design. Um, cybersecurity. You know, the, there's there's a million new majors that just emerged in the last 10 to 20 years. And of course, the pool of students uh, focusing on certain fields has been diluted. Now, some fields have remained strong. Of course, business is always going to be popular for a reason I don't understand, but I can talk about that here shortly. Um, you know, the tech stuff is, is of course, more popular now. Um, but yeah, when you, when, if a university only had 20 majors in the past, and they were traditional ones like history, philosophy, economics, mathematics, biology, pre-law, things like that, and now you add all of these other majors, well, of course, students are going to drift into those uh, and, and, and deplete the, the traditional majors. Again, not all have been that affected, but the humanities certainly have. What the real reason is, for the decline in English specifically, and I would I would venture to say the humanities in general, but I'm just going to focus on English because that's my field, is here's the real answer. We teach English incorrectly. We do it wrong. It's our own fault. We, over the last 30-ish uh, years, have basically destroyed ourselves. I wrote a piece, a short piece about this on my Substack a, a year ago, um, comparing it to Nietzsche's line about, um, you know, God is dead and, and we are the ones who killed him. It's sort of similar that if, we're, if English is dying, we are the ones who did it. We can only look at ourselves. We, we need to stop blaming, oh, there's not enough public funding. You know, there's, there's other interests that kids are in, you know, that they like. You know, all those might be true. But the real reason is that we've done it to ourselves. And the reason for that, or the, the, the path that has been followed, is that we have turned English, which was something that was devoted to the height of human 
ingenuity and excellence, something beautiful that, that explored deep truths about what it means to be a living human being in this world. And instead, we turned it into something that is quite literally meaningless. When you look at post-structuralism and deconstruction and postmodernism, which really came to the fore, you know, they, they started developing in the late 60s-ish, um, but they became sort of mainstream in the 90s. Well, what's happened since then? Well, the people who studied in the 90s, where, again, these, these forms of criticism in the field of English became dominant, well, those people who were getting their undergrad and then working towards their PhD work in the 90s or early 2000s, those are the people running all the departments now. You know, they're between ages, you know, 45 and 65 or whatever it is, and they have run the field of English into the ground. Because if you're someone who likes reading, you like stories, you like novels, maybe you like poetry or drama uh, or film or anything where you're studying, you know, the creative works of human beings, and you show up and your professor tells you every single day that none of these things mean anything, their language doesn't mean anything. Uh, there is no meaning to life. Everything is relative. Um, these people who wrote these works, especially old white men, were actually horrible people and we shouldn't take their work seriously anymore. And nothing matters. Well, why in the world would you want to study in that field? Of course you're going to want to go to something that sounds more interesting and is more positive. So the real answer, just right off the top of the, of the broadcast here, is English has declined because English professors have caused it. That is the answer. And then you combine the possible answer, the possible causes of maybe there's something to do with funding, but I'll get into that here in a second where that's just, it's just not true. Um, or just, you know, the diversity of other interests for, of students. English could still be strong if it were taught the right way. English is so valuable when it's, when it's actually taught as being valuable that, yeah, you know, there might be some declines, but it's not going to collapse if it's taught the right way. And that's what I try to do. I try to teach English the proper way where we, we show how valuable it is. We show the, the human genius that we can learn from and we can connect with each other and empathize with each other and learn about what it means to be a person and what, what beautiful art can look like and how it can transcend time and move people to feel deep things and act in important ways. Well, teachers don't do that anymore. Teachers now are um, grievance peddlers. They're complainers. Uh, English professors now um, point everything to race or class or gender or sex or nihilism or the incomprehensibility and therefore uselessness of language. That, that's what it is. And it's completely wrong and English people have been the cause of it. If you want to salvage it, come talk to me, shoot me an email, message me, or give me a phone call. I will talk to you about how to fix this because it can be salvaged if it's done the right way. And in my program that I'm the head of, we do it the right way. And we're building from scratch the right type of programs. If you want to learn more about that, let me know. But this is what's happening at state universities, especially, and, and even, even some private schools. Um, again, there are exceptions, which I'll touch on here in a moment. But uh, generally, this is, this is the reason for the collapse. English people have done it to themselves, and then they point fingers at the culture or at the government or at rich people or whoever, and they refuse to look at themselves. They are, they are, <laughs> they are Oedipus, wandering blindly, um, unwilling to look at the downfall they have personally caused. And so um, I'm giving, there's the answer right out of the gate. But uh, let me dive into this article a bit. And uh, the author jumps around, so I'm, you know, some of the, my thoughts as I go through the article might, might seem a bit scattered, but I'm, I'm just following what the article uh, outlines here um, and the notes I've taken on it because I've read it several times. And, um, you know, hopefully I can tie it all back together by the end. So at, uh, at this one university that has dropped um, so precipitously, this uh, major public university, um, though they still have over 570 undergraduate English majors, what's so interesting is they also have 71 English faculty that are on tenure track. 71. All right. So let's, you know, I know I'm an English guy, but the math is pretty easy here. That's an eight to one 
student to faculty ratio within the major. Eight to one. That's amazing, right? And that doesn't count the other faculty that are possibly full-time that are just instructors and not on tenure track, nor does it count the number of adjuncts or grad assistants or anyone else. Um, they do get into their online teaching as well. So they're, you know, that's going to be a, a separate number, but 71 professors who are tenured professors for 570 majors, all right, eight to one ratio. If you can't make your program work with an eight to one ratio, you have serious problems. Now, I will tell you what some of those problems are. Some of the people cited in this article at this university and elsewhere, when they talk about, well, we don't have enough funding, we don't, we don't have enough resources to, to serve the students, and so, so therefore the students go to other departments that are better, better funded or just more popular. One of the professors in this article all right, is quite a famous Shakespeare scholar. She teaches, from what I can tell by going on the university website and looking at the course schedule each year, for the last two years anyway, that's all I, I could go uh, in the back records and couldn't tell going forward, but the last two years, she's taught one class per year, not per semester, per year. She teaches one seven-week class that meets one night a week, so she basically goes to work for seven days, or at least teaching students. And that's it. For, the whole, for, for a whole year, it's one class. And that was both in spring sessions. So she doesn't teach in the fall. She's not on the schedule for, the, for next fall. One class a year, seven weeks. And the number of students in her class is around 10. So she teaches only 10 students. That's her whole job, at least from a teaching standpoint. This professor makes over a quarter million dollars a year. All right. Now, she probably has some sort of endowed chair, you know, endowed position maybe. So there probably is funding coming partly from somewhere else, but a quarter of a million dollars per year to teach 10 kids in one class for seven class periods out of an entire year. All right. So when people at these major universities say, we don't have enough funding. Now, this, this is probably an extreme example because she's pretty well known, but that, that's, that's the fantasy land these people are living in. All right. Another professor who is at uh, Columbia, um, he's similar. He teaches two classes per year, both in his own specialty. So he doesn't have to teach any generalist classes. He gets to decide, I only want to teach things in my specialty. What was funny is one of the classes he teaches uh, is a topics in American studies. And yet, because he's a Shakespeare scholar, he teaches Shakespeare in America. All right. So it's about American studies, but he focuses on Shakespeare, which is fine. That's, you know, he's the, he's the professor. He can do what he wants, but like, this is what we're dealing with. That guy teaches two classes. And I'm sure he makes, cause it's in New York city, maybe even makes more than that a quarter of a million dollars. All right. So just for comparison about thinking you're underfunded. All right. <laughs> I'm, I'm the chair of my program. I run two majors and I make about one fifth of what these professors make. Okay. Again, chair of two programs, one fifth, what these professors make. And I teach four or five classes. I'm going to teach five classes in the fall, four to five classes, every single semester, every single year. That tends to be about a hundred students. All right. So I teach 10 times as many students and I teach basically 10 times as many classes in general. All right. And I make, and I, chair two programs. So I, you know, even if you're the chair of your department, I chair two separate departments. Um, and I make one fifth of what those people make. So yeah, I don't want to hear from these professors about underfunding. Um, if you and your university have a funding problem, there are other things going on. Okay. Um, now if you're, if you're a department, at, if you're at a public university and you literally don't have enough full-time professors to teach all of your students, if, if you're, if you have you know, if you have a populated major and you don't have enough professors, well, that is a problem and you need to find funding from somewhere else. Um, and your administration is at fault. If your administration can't fund faculty when you have a populated department or just in general, a populated university, that's an administration problem. That's not a public funding problem. That's not a government funding problem. All right. That is poor management. Um, now, if you're looking for other types of funding, that's something that, that also is talked about in this article is uh, the comparison between the humanities and 
you know, the tech and science departments that get uh, cool buildings and all this fun technology and um, equipment and all this stuff. It's like, yeah, you know, if you're, if you're, your pre-med students need labs, all right? Your robotics program, yeah, needs equipment and space and technology, all right? Yeah, they, they need that. What exactly do you need? All right? I, t- I tell, you know, my bosses and my students and anyone else uh, on our campus, I'm like, all I need is a room with some chairs and a table. If That would be great. You find me that and I won't ask for anything else, okay? That's all an English class needs, all right? Now, yes, I know English is going in different directions where it's incorporating some technologies and things like that, but it's not going to have anywhere near the funding that your tech and science programs are going to have. So trying to compare to those departments is silly. And if you can't make it work as an English professor with a few chairs and a table, you're teaching English wrong because that's all you need. A good teacher can connect with students and show how amazing these pieces of literature are with just a room and a round table. That's all you need, all right? So again, if you are having a problem with your, uh, with your department shrinking, it is not the fault of the public. Um, it's a you problem. Fix your major by teaching things the right way and you won't have these problems or you won't have them as severely because uh, you know there, there still might be problems again. Um, there is dilution of the product and um, there's just other options that there weren't before. So, you know, there's going to be some decrease, but if you're having catastrophic problems, it's a you problem. Um, The author also interviews not only professors, but a variety of students and um, on various campuses. And a lot of the students are are discussing how they join certain majors because, you know, (laughs) they think that's where the money is. And um, there's just sort of a weird misunderstanding of what college really is, all right? What people are looking for in the in the world of hiring, all right, no matter what field, they're looking for people who are smart in general. And what smart means is, can you read? Can you write? Can you think? Can you speak? Math might help, you know, that if you can do at least some basic math, that's usually pretty good. And can you learn new concepts quickly? Because most of the world changes fairly fast. You know, every couple years, new businesses do new things, science changes, technology changes every six months. You have to be able to pick up things quickly. So that is really what businesses or, or any industry is looking for. Um, you have to just be smart. You can be smart in any field. All right. Thinking that majoring in business gives you an upper hand in business is just not fully accurate. That's what students think. They think, well, if I want to get a job and make money, then I need to major in business because that's the most common thing. And I'm going to go work for a business. I need to major in business. (laughs) It's just, it's just not true. Again, businesses are looking for anyone who is smart, has those basic human skills and is really hardworking and a fast learner. That that's about it. All right. Trust me, almost no one is going to ask you if you're a student wondering what you should major in almost no future company is going to ask you what you majored in. They just won't. All right. My wife runs her own business and she makes way more money than I am, uh, than I do because she's just very talented at her job. She didn't major in business. I don't think she ever took a business class in her whole life. And yet she runs a very successful business. Well, how? Because she's hardworking and disciplined and she's a good, she has excellent people skills. She's, she's a good writer, reader, speaker, and thinker. And, and she's good with numbers and So she just outperforms people. That's what it takes. Now, before she owned her own business and she was working for various other people in all the previous jobs she had, no one, I've asked her this, no one has, no one ever asked her, Hey, what'd you major in in college? What was your GPA? What coursework did you take? No one cared. If they cared at all, they did maybe care that you had a diploma and that's even up for debate because at least that shows you accomplished something and you had to, you know, follow some rules and listen to certain people and accomplish some tasks and show up on time. And, you know, that's, that's kind of what they want to find out beyond that. They want to know how quickly can you learn? How hard do you work? Um, and yeah, do you have basic skills that I can train you to do a variety of things? Cause that's really what happens when you get to your future job, they will train you because again, things change so rapidly that some new boss is going to say, Hey, we're changing directions. Look, I need, I need you to work on this now. 
And so you got to learn it. If you can't learn it, you're going to stay at your current position or you'll get demoted or you just won't, you'll just be passed over for, for promotions. People who learn quickly and who work really hard, they're the ones who make it uh, and who move up. So you can do that with anything. You can do that with an English major because an English major is a signal to the world that, hey, I'm excellent at reading. I'm excellent at writing. I'm excellent at thinking. I'm, un I'm excellent at understanding how humans work because I've studied how they think and I've studied how they act in a million different scenarios, fictional or real world. And you're very disciplined because you can sit and focus on things for a long time. That's what English people have to do. So as long as you can show that to your whoever, you know, whatever place you're applying to, you can get hired. All right. There is no stigma that, oh, you're an English major. You're, you're not talented enough to work at my company. That's just not, that's just not accurate. Before I even went into the field of English, I worked for a year uh, in the business world. I worked in the, in the digital, in the tech business world. I worked in the field of digital marketing. I knew nothing about digital marketing. I, I still hardly know anything about it. I knew even less back then. And yet I got hired at a, at a digital marketing firm. Why? Because when they um, asked all the applicants to take a test, I did better than everyone. Why? Because I'm smart and I can, and it was, it was a, a writing and language and, and marketing task that they had everyone do. And because I'm good with words and language and persuasion and how to appeal to people, I beat them all out and I got the job. Now, once I got the job, I was extremely bored by it. <laughs> I, I'm, I thought it might be interesting and I was bored out of my mind in the tech business world. And so I got out and that's when I, you know, for me, English was way more interesting. So then I focused my career on English and um, have been doing that for 20 years. So, you know, even someone who had no business or technology background got a job in that field. Why? Because I had very good basic skills and I picked up on things very quickly and my bosses could tell that. So that's how I got hired. That's what you do. So when, you know, there's a lot of uh, students that are interviewed in this, in this article that are like, well, you know, I'm going into this thing because I've been told that this will land me the best job. It's like, well, you don't, you don't know that. Um, and those people don't know that. Um, I'm doing it because my parents, you know, they'll never let me major in English. It's like, well, yeah, if your parents are footing the bill for a very expensive education, yeah, they, they probably do have a say in what they want you to study because they want to see a return on their investment. Now, they're, the return they're looking for is a bit misguided, but you know, at least they have a point because they're your parents. But if you're, if you're footing most of the bill and you have the freedom to study what you want, um, you should. You should study things you're interested in. Um, when I started school, I was in a certain major that I took one class that I thought was going to be really useful and interesting. And I took it and I was like, this is so boring. I hate this. <laughs> and so I switched to a major that was much more interesting and tailored to my own kind of goals and, um, and temperament and what I thought was interesting. And so that's what I did. So, you know, major in what you want as best you can. Um, if you're interested in books and art or music or whatever it is, and you think, well, there's no jobs, you'll find something. If you're a hard worker and a fast learner, you'll find something. Don't worry about it. Study what you want and become great at your field. That's all you have to do. This one, prof uh, he's a dean actually, um, the dean of humanities at, at a certain school. Um, he really offers something just so silly. Um, he says, in order to, to, to make the humanities more appealing, he says, uh, um, one of the things the students do in my program is they choose a famous humanities major and write about that person. If they know someone like John Legend majored in literature in college and made a really great career, they're like, oh yeah, that's cool. So he offers, uh, he keeps a list of famous people that he, he sends along to students. It's like, well, wait a second, you're using John Legend as your example. All right. As a, as a famous, uh, um, person who studied the humanities. All right. First of all, why do you care whether someone's famous? You should be looking at people who are doing important things in their field that they use their field to do interesting, important, valuable things in the world, especially regarding studying human beings. And instead, you chose someone, yeah, he's famous, but he's not famous because he's studied English. He's famous as, because he's a very talented musician. Well, 99.9% .9 of our English majors aren't going to be multi-millionaire recording artists. So why are you even using that as an example? That's ridiculous. So this, again, you're marketing your program poorly, all right, because you're emphasizing the wrong things. First of all, why, who cares about whether someone's famous or not? 
That's not why we go into what we do is to become famous. And secondly, how about we talk about people who are using their actual skills from that field to, to truly make a difference? Now, you could say, well, he used, John Legend uses his study of literature to write his songs, maybe his lyrics, like, maybe, I guess, but, you know, how many other musicians never studied literature once and yet they write great songs? So, you know, we need to, we need to know what the correlation is here. Picking someone famous, <laughs> that's not the reason to go into a certain uh, field. Another, uh, another student talked about how, um, you know, we feel like we need to go into certain fields because... Uh, and that, that aren't the humanities or specifically English because, you know, we really want to be able to make money at a young age and then retire at a young age. All right. So what's so ironic about the field of English and the humanities in general is that they talk about privilege all the time and who's privileged and, you know, who has all the power and all this stuff. Uh, the person who who's had that quote would be someone who would be considered probably not holding privilege here in America. And yet that is what she said. <laughs> okay. She said, well, we want to be able to make money and retire early. Like no generation of young people throughout all of human history ever has been able to say, oh, I think it's reasonable that I make a lot of money when I'm young and then retire early. No one has ever said that except these very privileged young people. And again, this is a student that would in the in the privilege hierarchy game that these dummies play at these universities, this person would not be at the top of that. And yet even her, even she thinks this way. All right. So this is the mentality of young people today, which again, we have, we have trained them to think this way, or we have, we have enticed them to think that this is a viable option for their future. When like, this is the most privileged first world thing anyone could possibly say, Oh, I expect the world to be so available to me that I'm going to make a bunch of money when I'm 25 and then I'm going to retire by the time I'm 40. Who in the world thinks that? Well, today's young people do. So we have to change their thinking, bring them back down to reality, stop living in fantasy land and go, yeah, you know what? All of us have to work for a lot of years because that's what life is about. You got you to gotta do things and we all have bills to pay. And so whatever field you choose, you're going to need to work hard at it for quite a long time. That's how it is. So... Might as well pick a field you like because you're going to be in it for a really long time. The other irony of all this is um, the paragraph right below that quote. Um, she talks about how, you know, our, our, we're just way more advanced. Our generation is a lot more progressive in our thinking. <laughs> First of all, progressive does not mean necessarily good. All right. You can, you can call anything progress. You could be harming yourself. Um, you need to be very clear on what exactly is good about what you're doing. What we also see from young people today is how progressive they are and how much money they think they're going to make. And they're pursuing all these fashionable majors that they think are going to lead to success very quickly. What do we know about young people, especially, but the, the population in general, they're more miserable than ever. Our current culture is on more drugs and spends more time doing frivolous things than any generation that's ever existed. Well, this doesn't seem like you're very progressive and enlightened and happy and satisfied. Maybe it's because you've spent your time in college not learning how to be a human being. Maybe that was the problem. If you'd have spent more time studying fields like history so you could learn about our relationship to the past and where we've come from and, and you know where we fit in the timeline of history, Maybe you could have spent more time in philosophy, understanding the, the deep ideas of what it means to be a human being and, and what morality is and, and what would be the, the best way, considering all the trade-offs, for how to organize a society. Maybe you could have spent more time studying the great artworks and the great literary works of human history so you can understand the, not only the time periods, but the emotions of these people and how they felt like how life was and life always is. What are the eternal truths that we can find in those things? Maybe if you'd spend more time in the humanities, we wouldn't have the problem with, <clears throat> with unhappiness and prescription medication addiction and depression and anxiety and all these problems that we think we've become so progressive and advanced and yet things are worse in, in many ways than ever. Crime is up. Our currency is completely devalued. Politics is a mess. 
We have crooked people running our banks and our financial systems. It's like, oh, yeah, we need more business majors, really. These, all those people who are ruining our economy, they're all business majors. You think, you think this is progress? You know, all the technology that, yeah, some of it's good, but some of it's also making us really dumb and lazy and, and unaware of what life is really about. Is that really good? Do we need more people developing more apps? Is that really something that we actually need? Well, maybe not. Maybe we need people to go to college to truly learn what it means to be a human being. And who knows? Maybe things might be better. Maybe if we focus more on what's truthful and what's beautiful and what's good and what's just instead of what makes money and what the new what the cool new gadget in tech is or what new way we can, you know, run our banking system into the ground. Like maybe the humanities might be an answer for all this. But again, why would anyone study feels like English if once you're in that classroom, the professor just tears you apart, tears tears you and the field down. What's so amazing is no other field does that. No, there's no you know, you're not going to go into an architecture class and the person running the class is like, "I hate buildings. Bridges are stupid. I I hate all the people who built these buildings because they were old white men. Like no one, no one thinks that people think, well, we get, we need to build certain, you know, we need to follow mathematical principles so that we can, and, and principles of physics so that we can build uh, safe and durable buildings uh, that also might look cool. You know, that's what we're here to do. We're, we're here to do important, cool things. Well, that's not what you get in the humanities, especially English. You walk into English and you think you're going to study what a great author Hemingway was, and you're going to hear you know, four weeks about how he was, uh, you know, a drunk misogynist who, um, you know, who, who had a horrible worldview and his writing isn't that good. And so we should read someone else. (laughs) Who wants to go to that classroom? So you English teachers, you're the problem. You know, if you go into the, the sciences, they're, they're trying to do important things. You know, you're in biology or, or physics, um, they're not spending time grieving over the fact that Einstein was an old white man. No, they're learning from Einstein to figure out what we can learn next. So why can't the humanities do that? Well, it's because the people who, who came of age in grad school in the 90s, uh, who are now running all those programs, well, they've ruined it. That's the problem. So we got to rescue it. Um, and that's what I'm trying to do. I was very pleased to hear that there are a couple professors who have a little bit of wisdom. There is a professor at Harvard where she says, um, well, I'll just read the paragraph. The initial gesture of criticism can seem to carry more prestige than the long pursuit of understanding. Completely true. We are not teaching students to truly understand literature or other created works. We're just critiquing them. One literature professor and critic at Harvard, not old or white or male, noticed that it had become more publicly rewarding for students to critique something as, quote, problematic than to actually grapple with what the problems might be. They seemed to have found that merely naming concerns, grieving, had more value in today's cultural marketplace than curiosity about what they were really about. This clay pigeon approach to inquiry, clever phrase, struck her as a devaluation of all that criticism and art can do. Exactly. All right. Approaching literature in a way where you just hold up an ideology and say, this book represents this ideology. Ta-da, done. I've critiqued it. That means nothing. It doesn't lead you to understanding. And it devalues what true criticism is, where you're truly trying to determine um, how artistic or you know, the quality of the presentation of a piece of art, a piece of literature. That's what real criticism is. And uh, just complaining about it, that's not it. Now, what's interesting about this is notice how I described this woman. Not old or white or male. And she's just one literature professor and critic at Harvard. Why is her name not in here? Well, you can guess. She didn't want to be uh, named. She, she decided to be anonymous because what she said here is quite controversial in, in you know, higher ed literary circles. You're not allowed to say publicly that, you know what, all this style of criticism we do is kind of dumb and it's actually harming our field. Yeah, so she had to be anonymous because even though she's apparently a young 
female of some ethnicity, she feels it's unsafe to actually speak the truth because she's going to get criticized and, and condemned probably at her own school and elsewhere for saying something that is actually true. So take that as a really important piece of information that when someone has a different opinion, they aren't even a lot, they aren't even comfortable enough to go on the record with their own name. That's what the field of English has done. Instead of saying, you know what? Everyone's free to have their opinion. Let's all bat these ideas around. Let's compare and see what works and what students uh, find useful and, and um, what upholds the, the tradition of literature best. Let's, let's uh, discuss those. Nope. You have to be anonymous. Otherwise, you won't have a job. And so this lady, even though she's at Harvard, she felt like it wasn't safe enough to criticize. Um, another professor... Um, has argued that the professional practice of scholarship has become self-defeatingly disdainful. Um, contemporary critics pride themselves on their power to disenchant. So again, exactly, that's just what I, what I said. Why in the world would we do this? Why would, in the world would we want to talk to our students in a way that demonizes the very field we've devoted our lives to? We've, we've gone to school all these years. We've become experts. We've published works. We, we're supposed to love this. Um, one of the professors that is in this article, she's a, she's a Shakespeare scholar. And basically when you read her work, she doesn't like Shakespeare. <laughs> all she does is complain about it. Well, not all she does, but what she's famous for is complaining about it. All right. I'm sure she probably teaches other things too, uh, other methodologies, but the big thing that she spends most of her time on and what she's become well known for is she complains about it. So like, why in the world would you want to do that? That is amazing. You should want to be the biggest advocate of your field possible. And uh, that's just not happening. You know, the article right before that also discusses um, this, this shared culture idea, which I'm a, I'm a big believer in. I believe the, well, the, the whole point of education from K through college is to develop shared culture so that we all have things we can, we can talk about and we can make references that we all understand so that we can get along more efficiently and effectively with each other. Um, I'm a big fan of E.D. Hirsch and other cultural um, cultural literacy uh, advocates. What's interesting is there's a passage here that says, being able to appreciate a Thelonious Monk record or a Miller play or the wild sprawl of a Pinchon novel was a widely held objective. This is, uh, you know, several decades ago. It's like, yeah, it was. But a word there is now the problem. The word is appreciate. Now, Thelonious Monk can probably still be appreciated because he's of a particular background, and so no one would probably dare to criticize him. But we don't look at Arthur Miller plays or Thomas Pynchon novels the same way we used to. Appreciation is not allowed in most of these university uh, English classrooms. You're not allowed to uphold Hemingway or whoever as a quality author. Your job is to now tear those people down. So even the language that's being used here... Um, sort of exposes what the problem is. They're like, boy, we used to be able to appreciate these things. Well, yeah, the fact that we can't appreciate is the fault of the English professors. So again, if you want to appreciate the great works of our culture, whether it's in music or whether it's in film or whether it's in literature or painting or whatever, come, come study with me because I'll teach you to appreciate things and not just tear things down uh, for my own selfish grievances um, or, or trendy complaining. So this is what's going on. Um, maybe if people took more time to study human beings a little bit better, um, we could appreciate each other a little bit more and we wouldn't be fighting with each other so much. So many departments, um, as the author describes, are, are um, advocating things like impact and innovation. You know, their buildings have those words posted out front. And so it attracts certain students and it's like, okay, fine, but this is also where it leads students astray because they think they want to have an impact. They think they want to innovate and change the world when they don't know anything about the world. You need to learn about the world first before you go and try and change it. I wrote a passage about this in my book for college freshmen where I said, stop trying to impact the world. You need to let the world impact you for a while. And that's what college is for where you learn about great ideas, you learn about great people, you learn about different um, methodologies and, and uh, 
techniques for accomplishing certain goals. You have to you have to let the world work on you, and that's what we as teachers are supposed to do in all of the departments and coursework that students take. You're supposed to, you know, ideally at liberal arts universities, you take a variety of courses so that you can have the world work on you from a variety of angles. Um, instead, we're now basically shuttling these students into one field immediately as fast as possible because the kid thinks that's what he wants to do, even though he doesn't know anything about it. And we're telling him, you're going to go change the world when you don't know anything about the world. So I understand why the science and tech people do that in their advertising. Um, and it's, you know, it's a way to get kids excited. I understand that, but the kids don't know what they want. They don't, they don't know what they don't know. And that's the whole point of college, but we're kind of abdicating that, that task or that responsibility that professors should have. And, you know, you can see what state, uh, of the culture we're in right now, um, on a variety of fronts. As another example, um, one English professor, um, was talking about how students seem to only be oriented toward the present, um, they had lost their, the line is, they lost their bearings in the past. And that's exactly right. Um, if you don't know the context of things, you don't know where you are. Um, uh, Mark Edmondson, the professor at Virginia, in his one of his books, he talks about, uh, I think the phrase is, he, he talks about the perpetual now. It's like, yeah, you think everything in the world is happening to you right now at this very moment for the very first time. Whereas when you study the past, you can go, well, wait a minute, these things have happened before and here's how we dealt with it. And maybe that was the right or wrong way, but at least we know of some options. And so, you know, maybe this isn't something to be that worried about because we can, we can deal with it. But if everything is happening in the moment and that's all you're focused on and you think everything is brand new because you have no experience, especially as a student, you have no experience because you're 18 years old, but you also have no experience from the, from the intellectual world. You haven't read enough. You haven't talked to enough smart people to tell you what things were like 50 years ago, 200 years ago, 2000 years ago, where we could learn from human history. And then the present wouldn't be quite so daunting, but our, you know, through technology and just our, our perspective on the world now, everything is in the present. And this is something that, um, is really harming our students, um, that they come to, uh, another professor says that they come to school, um, thinking about the unenlightened past that has nothing left to teach. It's like, oh, that is a recipe for disaster. If you think you can't learn anything from the past, then you're going to make all the mistakes that have already been made, and you're just going to keep making them because you didn't learn from things that came before you. So so this is a real problem, and again, this is what in my field, in my department of English, we talk about all the time. Let's learn from these people who came before us in the real world and in the imaginative world in things like fiction, we can learn from people who created these fictional worlds and how they dealt with life from a, from a, you know, through their own human struggles. And we can discuss those as options as well. But if you never think about the past or, you know, these, these longstanding ideas that have shaped who we are, the good ideas and the bad, well, then you're just going to keep repeating them and making the same mistakes. And you're going to perpetually think everything is the present. And it's just not. Um, but that's what the humanities are for. That's what it means to teach you how to be a person. Now, as I said, this isn't necessarily every university. There are a few outliers here. Um, this one paragraph is really good, which echoes what I've been talking about. Bring back the awe, some say, and students will follow, which I firmly believe. If you build it, they will come. If you build something in the right way, students will find you because there are enough people out there that they will, they will join you. Uh, one person says, um, professor at Claremont McKenna said, my department, the author is very much alive, which is a, a reference to how uh, critics over the years have basically the death of the author, where uh, whatever the author said or intended isn't real and doesn't matter. It's whatever your interpretation is as the reader, that's all that counts. And so you can make text mean whatever you want it to mean. And he's sort of joking that, uh, no, no, the author is kind of important. We need to listen to what he or she has written and uh, try to analyze it in, in good faith. Um, he says uh, there's still healthy enrollment in his program. Um, 
again, Claremont and McKenna, UC Berkeley still doing pretty well. He says, we are very concerned with the beauty of things, with aesthetics, and ultimately with judgment about the value of works of art. I think there is a hunger among students for the thrill that comes from truth and beauty. That's exactly right. So this guy's figured it out. Seems like some programs have, have, you know, have emphasized that and they're, they're flourishing still. They're doing just fine. Um, so there's your model. You want to find programs that uh, you want to build your department up? Follow that. Stop complaining about uh, other causes when you're the ones who have gone off track with what you, uh, with the way you teach English. So uh, take a look at the article if you want. Nathan Heller is the author. The End of the English Major in the New Yorker about two weeks ago uh, is the article. And uh, the big takeaway is there is a lot of grumbling about what's going on in English departments and the humanities in general. And some of it is warranted. Yeah, the numbers are dropping. Um, numbers are dropping in a variety of fields. So it's not just those, um, not just those humanities. But um, we have to look inward. We keep putting the blame on other people. Um, we keep uh, claiming that it's a money problem when it's not. It's a teaching problem. We um, aren't teaching our students about what it means to respect or even to be in awe of things anymore. Um, we have become a culture that tears things down instead of building things up. We have become a culture that um, advocates envy and complaining instead of learning from others and following path, uh, patterns and pathways that have worked in the past that could be successful again. Instead, we go, I don't like that. They're wrong. They're you know, bigoted or phobic in some way, and therefore I don't have to listen. It's like, you can learn a lot from the people who have come before us. And the world of art can teach us amazing things if we are willing to embrace it. And uh, yeah, there's always going to be trends. There's always going to be the next shiny thing that um, whether it's kids or teachers or, or anyone else wants to latch onto and think, this is the way of the future. I want to do this. Yeah, maybe. that might that, There might be something to that. But there's always room for studying what came before us and what amazing things the human mind and the human culture have created. And again, in my department, that's what we do. And um, sadly, I wish my colleagues would have the same approach. So that's it for today. Thanks for listening. Take a look at that article if you like. And I hope you tune in next time to English Champion.